One thing you might be asked to do on an exam is describe a function based on its implementation. So let's look at an example and try to do that and figure out some strategies for approaching these kinds of questions. So let's imagine that there is a function likes which takes in a non-negative integer n and returns whether George Boole likes that number. We don't have the implementation and it would be quite hard to reconstruct it, but we have to imagine that it exists. And a question on an exam might say, what does mystery one do? Now we can't just run it since it calls likes and we don't know how to run likes, so we'll have to think. And oftentimes the descriptions will have some kind of template like mystery one prints something less than n something and maybe it will give you some multiple choice alternatives or maybe you'll have to fill it in. One approach to this kind of problem is to read the code then read the description options so that you know what you're choosing amongst and then focus on an example in order to figure out what the right answer is. And step three might not be necessary but it's still a good idea because it lets you check your work. So read the code. Mystery one takes in n, sets k equal to one while k is less than n. If likes n, print k, then add two to k. So k starts out at one. While k is less than n, this doesn't change k or n. So we're adding two, k will be three, and then five, and then seven. So this will print odd numbers but it's not gonna print all the odd numbers because there's this if statement. So now maybe we look at the options, but let's imagine that there's one like mystery one prints all odd numbers less than n that George likes. Well, that looks promising, but don't forget step three, consider an example. So what would that mean? Well, that would mean picking some behavior for likes. Like let's pretend that George Bull likes prime numbers and picking some value for n like eight and then tracing through and figuring out what will happen. So if we call mystery one on eight, then n will be bound to eight, k will be bound to one, one is less than eight. If likes n is actually if likes eight, and if likes is, is prime, well, it turns out George doesn't like eight, and so we will not print. But since this is not indented as part of the if statement, this will get executed anyway. So we'll go to k equals three and go through again. If likes eight, don't print again. Oh, this will actually never print in this example, which means that this description is wrong. We're not printing all the odd numbers less than n that George likes. Otherwise we'd be printing prime numbers like three. But when we worked through an example, we found that this doesn't print three. It doesn't print anything because n never changes and George didn't like n. So a correct description would be that mystery one prints all odd numbers less than n, but only if George likes n, because we have likes n here. This would have been the correct description if this had said if likes k, but it doesn't. So you can't solve these problems just by following your intuition or thinking about what's reasonable. The point of the problem is to make sure that you understand how the code works. And so you're going to have to think about every line and how it behaves. Okay, that was a warm up. Now we'll do a bigger one. Mystery two. That's a lot. Maybe we should just give up. No, let's follow our approach. Read the code, read the description, consider an example. It sets i, j, and k to zero, none, and none, while i is less than n. If George likes i, then, wow, we do something complicated that changes k and j. And then, no matter whether George likes i or not, we add one to i. Oh, and that's the condition of the while statement. So just by reading the code, I've seen one thing, which is that i will start at zero. It will work its way up to n, and it will always increment, always add one. So if n is eight, it'll go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we'll check whether George likes each one of those. And then we'll do something in here that I'm not quite sure I understand yet. So maybe reading the description would help. Here's the description. Mystery two returns something or returns none if something else. Okay, it only actually returns in one place. So K starts out as none, but then gets reassigned. All right, so this part has to be something about if K equals never gets assigned. 
And uh, otherwise, if k does get assigned to something that's not none, then we're going to describe that behavior here. But I still don't know how this works, because there's some big mess in the middle. Maybe I should consider an example. And this one seems complicated enough that I could just go ahead and use Python Tutor in order to do it. So let's go ahead and paste in this code and decide what we're going to call it on. How about 8 again? That seemed reasonable. But we also need a definition for likes that we can actually implement. So let's pick something really simple. George likes even numbers, let's say. We might have to change this later because we're just experimenting, but at least we can let Python do some of the work of telling us what's going on. And then we start evaluating. So we define these functions, we call mystery on eight. So n is eight and eight is never gonna change, but i, j, and k are going to change. And as expected, i is just gonna go from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and then it'll be done. But what's going on with j? Well, let's find when j changed. Oh, there it changed. It changed because as we were going through all the i's, we found one that George liked. George liked zero, and so j got assigned to that. Nothing happened to k yet. It seems like you can only change k after you have a value for J. Okay, so let's go a little bit longer and see when's the first time that we actually get to this long line that's hard to understand. Well, here we have J still bound to zero and I bound to two. Why is that? Well, we're going through all the I's, counting upwards. We found one that George likes and J was bound to the last one that George liked. So when we get to this key line, line eight, I is bound to some number that George likes and J is bound to the last number that George likes. And what happens? We bind K to two, which is the difference between this number that George likes and the last number that George likes. Now that we have that example, it might be easier to interpret this. So once we know the last number that George likes, we're going to update K to be the difference between the current and the last if k is none, so if we've never seen such a difference before, or if i minus j is less than k. If the current number that George likes minus the last number that George likes is smaller than the gap between the two that we saw before, or the difference that we saw before. Oh, then we assign it to the difference now. This is a pattern that will make k eventually bound to the smallest difference between i and j as we rebind it every time we find one that's smaller than anything we've seen before. So we could trace through the rest of the code step by step, but I think we already know where this is headed. It should be the case that mystery 2.8 is the smallest difference between any two numbers that George likes. And if George likes even numbers, then that smallest difference should be two. And that's what we got. If we wanted to be really sure, I think we could try with different likes functions and see what happens. But I think we know enough to try to answer the question now. Mystery 2 returns the smallest difference between two positive integers below n that George likes. Oh, but we forgot about this part, or returns none. When's it going to return none? Well, if k never gets assigned, which means this whole expression is always false, and as soon as you have a j and k is none, you're going to assign k. And as soon as you have an i, you're going to have a j. So if George doesn't like any numbers, then we'll never go in here. k will never get a sign, and it'll be none. If George likes one number, then we won't assign k yet, but we will assign j. But still, k will never get a sign, and we'll return none. But if it's ever the case that there are two different numbers below n that George likes, we're going to end up assigning k to something, the difference between those two. So the way I would complete this is to say that there's no two such integers or a longer description would be there are no two integers below n that George likes. Mathematicians use this word such to refer to conditions that have already been stated, but it's okay to just write them out again too. So I think we could have studied this code longer and maybe probably gotten the answer. But I found it easier to get to the answer just by considering an example. 
So I hope that gives you a flavor for the process that would help you describe what a function does.